Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the IBM Kiskid Live Quantum Seminar Series. I'm your host, Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum, and I'm thrilled to roll out this week's seminar with Alessandro Miano from Yale University. This is episode, I believe, 112, and I'm so glad you joined us on time. Before we begin with introductions, we like to give everyone just a minute or two to tune into the live stream which gives us the opportunity to begin to discuss and have an interaction. Our favorite question is, where are you guys tuning in from today? You can reply to that in the comment chat box above, below, left, or right on the YouTube screen. That's the same place where you can interact with Alessandro Miano and myself during the talk, ask questions, have a discussion with each other. Now, it's also a special week. And in honor of March 14th, we'll do something we haven't done on the seminar before. I'm going to try to tell you a dad joke. I hope you're ready for it. Here's the question. Why should you never start talking to Pi at a party? Because it just goes on forever. <laughs> Happy Pi Day. This seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on the Kiske <laughs> YouTube channel with all of our best jokes. So you can always go back, catch up on anything you missed but you can only ask questions live during the seminar series here. So with that, folks, I think it's time we begin with the latest episode of the IBM Kiskid Live seminar series. Today, I have the pleasure and privilege of hosting Alessandro Miano from Michel Devere's group at Yale University. Hello, Alessandro. How are you today? I'm, I'm good. Thanks. And I want to thank you and all the organizers for inviting me uh, today to this talk. I'm glad to hear myself and Paul, uh, who's running the channel here, have are great to see you and to have folks tune in. Alessandro hails from Naples, Italy, uh, where uh, Alessandro received his bachelor and master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Naples, Federico II. Alessandro did his PhD also in Italy, earning him an IEEE CSE graduate uh, fellowship recognition, and now Miano is a postdoctoral associate at Yale University in Michelle Devere's group. So with that, Alessandro, the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you, Zlato, for the introduction. And before I start, I also want to thank all the scientists that I had the pleasure to work with on this project. And today I'm going to, um, to discuss uh, one of the last results we got, uh, in particular, we developed a new theory to, to model uh, arbitrary Josephson flux biased circuits. And I'm going to discuss this theory and also show its implication uh, to, to facilitate the engineering of nonlinear effects uh, for, for uh, superconducting quantum information processing circuits. OK, let's start. So I like to start uh, with a brief overview of what are the building blocks that we have uh, into this field. So before of that, uh, my outline is going to be um, divided in three main parts. So I'm going to give an intro introduction where I will show the building blocks of these type of circuits and some interesting uh, problems that we have to that, that we have to face when we use them. And then in the first part, I will show how it is possible to describe the effective potential energy function of an arbitrary uh, Josephson di dipole. In the second part, I will show some results and applications of this theory. And then in the end, I will discuss the conclusions and the next steps. Okay, so let's start with the intro introduction. As I was saying, um, in, in superconducting circuits, especially when we use them for quantum applications, there are like many type of components that can be um, used. Uh, the most uh, simple ones are the linear components that all of you might know. Um, we typically use um, capacitors, which, which, to which we associate a uh, capacitance. Uh, that are described by an Hamiltonian of this kind. Here, EC is the charging energy of the ca capacitor, and N is the number of electrons that are um, uh, deposited to the, on, on the plates. 
and this n is proportional to the voltage across the capacitor itself. We also have linear inductors, which are characterized by an inductance, <clears throat> and they can, can be described by a quadratic Hamiltonian of this kind, where this phase variable can be seen as a normalized magnetic flux and is proportional to the time integral of the voltage drop across the in inductor it itself. More in general, uh, any distributed microwave linear circuit is, 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 a, is a component that can be inserted in a superconducting circuit. And to describe like, uh, you know, like a complex element of this kind, we typically use an admittance matrix in the Fourier domain. So it's a, it's a matrix whose components are function of the frequency uh, of the signals that we use to, to interact with them. Apart from linear components, which are easy to un understand and also to fabricate, there are like uh, more exotic components which have nonlinear properties. And the main component that we are going to, to discuss to today is the Josephson tunnel junction. The Josephson tunnel junction is typically associated to this cross symbol, which indicates uh, an element that is capable of, of, of uh, su 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 sustaining a current flow, which is uh, given by tunneling of Cooper pairs uh, across a oxi oxide barrier, or in general, like any in insulator. Um, this tunneling element itself implements a nonlinear Hamiltonian, which looks like this. So you have a cosine dependence on, on the phase drop across the tunneling element. However, the, uh, a real Josephson tunnel junction will also host a parallel capacitance that is given essentially by the presence of this insulator between two superconducting leads. And to, to account also for that, um, we typically use this symbol, which is the tunneling element, which is the cross, and close it in a box, which indicates the presence of a capacitance. So the total Hamiltonian of a Josephson tunnel junction, um, it's typically written in this way. So we're going to have a kinetic component given by the capacitor, and then a tunneling component be given by the cross symbol. Now, once we have a Josephson junction, we can obviously um, insert it into a more complex environment, which can be made by an arbitrary combination of the linear components that, that you see here on the left of the slides. And this obviously creates more sophisticated nonlinear components that can have in interesting properties. In particular, one of the simplest arrangements that we can do is taking a Josephson junction and em embedding it into a superconducting ring that can also be magnetically biased by, by an external magnetic field. This field will produce a magnetic flux into the loop that we call uh, capital phi. And then uh, here we are going to associate to this flux um, um, dimensionless uh, flux variable, which has the that dimension of a, of, a, of a phase, which we will call phi e. Here, the bar on top indicates that this is a DC constant value. So in the rest of the talk, we are going to focus on DC magnetically uh, biased uh, su superconducting loops. Why this is in in interesting? Well, when you um, implement such a, such a st structure, um, as a function of the, of the mag magnetic flux threaded to the loop, it is possible to, to adjust the nonlinear properties of this uh, Josephson junction here. And this is very interesting because it gives an in situ knob to change the physical behavior of the circuit. Now, this looks like a very simple and isolated loop. Obviously, this is typically interfaced with, a more, um, with, with more circuitry. And depending on the complexity of, of the loop and also of the surrounding devices, it is possible to attach it to the environment via two or more terminals. 
And so you 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 can have uh, two terminal devices, which we will call dipole, three terminals, four terminals, and so on. For the rest of the talk, we are going to focus on two terminal devices, we, which we will refer to as dipole. This is just for the sake of simplicity, but the theory that I'm going to show can be extended at, as well to multi-terminal elements. Could I just clarify what you mean by physical properties of JJ? It's not like you don't mean that you're changing its EJ or anything like that. The actual element is still physically behaving the same, and you just mean that its response within the circuit is, yes. is yes. now adjusted. Correct. Right? Correct. In some sense, we are essentially in this way we can impose an external bias on top of the junction. However, there is like also, you know, if you if you have more complex structures like a DC squid. A DC squid, when you tune it magnetically, that can act as an as a single junction that has a tunable EJ. But that's yeah, it's a more like involved type of example. Excellent. And then because this will come up later, uh, mm -hmm. slightly tricky and more advanced question: Are what is are the five are the curly five variables compact or non-compact in your description? In other words, do they go between zero and two pi, or do they go from minus infinity to infinity, especially when they're in the Josephson junction potential? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. Yes. So I think this is a very important point. As you will see, when we will analyze the properties of these circuits, we are going to have a purely classical treatment, and then the quantization can be used as a last step once we introduce the basis of the ladder operators associated to an effective linear in inductance. So this means, so classically, we can just say that all the all the all the quantities are going to be periodic in this classical variable which is the phase so yes we can we can look at what happens at the physical level between minus pi and pi and then assume that things are going to be periodic with that so here uh, in this talk we are not going to face the problem of 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 the phase operator which which can be a little tricky to deal with depending on if you have periodic or a periodic uh, systems. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, as, as I was saying, we're going to focus on two terminal de devices, which we will call dipoles. And these dipoles, they have many applications in, in superconducting quantum information processing. Um, it, it will be clear in a couple of slides why this is the symbol that we're going to use for this tunable Josephson dipoles but in general they can be inserted uh for for instance inside a resonator so they can be shunted by a capacitance and then it is possible to write an effective hamiltonian implemented by this nonlinear mode which is going to have a linear response and then some non-linear non terms which are weighted by these coefficients gn which Rep represents the strength of n photon interactions that are possible inside this re 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 resonator. Uh, these nonlinear modes have been extensively used to, to make qu quantum limited amplifiers and also a, a huge variety of qubits that you can read more about in this nice re review uh, in 2020. These tunable dipoles can also be used to couple different uh, linear modes. So for instance, they can be put in the middle of two bosonic cavities. And then if we drive at the right frequency uh, with external pump photons, then uh, this nonlinear element is capable of generating uh, inter inter interactions that essentially swap one excitation between cavity A and B or vice versa. Uh, this particular coupling Hamiltonian here is a, um, is a beam splitter um, um, Hamiltonian and has been recently demonstrated based on three-wave mixing in these two papers. And more in general, these uh, Jovison dipoles can generate pa parametric interaction between arbitrary networks as demonstrated in this recent PRX quantum. So this obviously means that it's 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 important to have a good modeling ca capabilities for 
uh, these um, uh, these flux bias dipoles because they have very interesting and practical applications. So let's take a look first at how should we approach in general uh, a modeling of this type of circuit. As I said before, a Judson junction implements a nonlinear resonator because together with the tunneling element, there is also a capacitance in parallel. So if we build an arbitrary loop, this is essentially a superconducting ring, but with an arbitrary arrangement of linear inductances and Joseon junction. And this ring is also shunted by an external capacitance, which typically is assumed to be much, be, uh, much bigger than the capacitances uh, that are intrinsic to the junctions themselves. So we can write the Hamiltonian of this system as a sum of a kinetic term, which is given by the capacitive network, and an inductive term, which is given by the inductive and Josephson network. The inductive uh, part of this Hamiltonian can also be tuned with this external flux. So that's actually the knob that we will have to change the nonlinear behavior of these systems. However, this very omnicomprehensive description might be a little, um, you know, like it's it it can be very involved to 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 deal with, especially if the number of junction grows inside uh, the the loop. And so, however, like if 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 we know that the shunt capacitance that we put in parallel to this system dominates on top on the in, of the internal capacitances that are implemented by the Jolison junction, it might be possible to, to, to obtain a phenomenological model of this circuit that can ease the intuitions, especially in, in experimental scenarios. Indeed, based on, on, on this assumption, many uh, flux bias dipoles have been demonstrated both theoretically and experimentally in the last uh, 20 years almost. Uh, and um, we have some very well-known structures like the DC squid and the RF squid um, that, that were used um, especially for making parametric amplifiers and also some type of qubits. And then more recently, we also uh, had the snail and the quartan, which are um, extensions of this type of dipole suite arrays of junctions in one of their arm. And these circuits were all very successfully described by a phenomenological potential energy function, which is essentially obtained by assuming that the loop does not have any internal capacitance. Under this assumption, it is possible to, to, to assume that the loop will behave in a purely inductive way. And so it is possible also to show that um, um, if you have a potential energy function of, of this kind, it can be associated to a tunable nonlinear inductor. Uh, here, the tuning knob is this phi e, and you will see that the expansion coefficients of this potential energy function, i.e. the, um, the nonlinear inductor, are going to be also flux tunable. So this representation is very useful because it kind of, uh, you know, includes many interesting properties, mostly the nonlinear properties of these circuits, in a, in a function of a single variable that is easy to deal with and also to gather intuition with. However, what's the catch here? Well, the catch is that not all the possible structures um, made by linear inductances and Joseon junctions um, can be uh, explicitly modeled in this way because this potential energy function does not have an analytical expression for an arbitrary configuration. Only for this very simple structure, it is possible to first write the potential energy function and then find the expansion coefficients by doing uh, the derivatives of end order. So let's try to dig a little more into this. Uh, and to do this, I want to give as an example the snail. 
So in the case of the snail, we have a single junction here on the left that uh, implements this type of uh, term in the potential energy function. And then we have an array of three junctions. Now, this array of three junctions under certain <coughs> sorry, re reasonable assumptions can be modeled by a term of this kind. And so you see, like, if we have um, a, an ideal snail, we can write its potential energy function and then compute the expansion co coefficients and so on. We can also do another step, which is like taking um, M identical snails, all ideal, and concatenating them in an in a array. Also, this type of structure is going to have <clears throat> an analytical expression, which is essentially a rescaled version of the potential energy function of an individual snail. This is nice, but it's, it's a very ideal situation because it's it, it can only be applied to a very small subset of all the possible circuits that we can do. Uh, the catch here is that only if you have uniformities in arrays, you can actually write these potential energy functions in this way. But as soon as you start to have this uniformity, it's very, very difficult to come up with an, an effective potential energy function. You can always write the full n-body Hamiltonian, but as we were saying before, that might hide <clears throat> the phenomenological properties of the circuit. So with this, I want to introduce uh, the main question that we will answer in this talk, which is the following. Can we find the expansion, uh, the Taylor expansion of the potential energy function for an arbitrary Josephson dipole? If we can answer this question, it means that we'll have a useful knob to deal with um, many, many more configurations on top of the ones that, that we already know. So this introduces the first part of the talk where I'm going to discuss how to actually compute this effective potential energy function. So the, <clears throat> the first point here will be to, uh, to compute the Taylor expansion co coefficients in a kind of uh, bottom-up way. And I think it's going to be clear in a couple of slides. What do I mean with that? So let's start by, by saying, okay, we have two nonlinear inductors, um, A and B. And let's suppose for now that we know their expansion coefficients up to order n called A n and B n. Now, these two nonlinear inductors can be arranged either in a parallel combination or in a series combination. And <clears throat> we are going to define the parallel potential energy function U uh, P and the series potential energy function Us. And each of them are, uh, is going to have its own expansion coefficient U sub N P and U sub N of S. Now, the, um, the expansion coefficients of the parallel combination are actually pretty easy to compute. Indeed, they can be found <clears throat> trivially as the sum of the expansion coefficient of the left arm A and the right arm B. However, for the series combination, uh, the situation is a little more involved. In fact, if you impose uh, the necessary constraints that you can find also in um, in the in the paper that this <clears throat> work is based on, you will see that if you want to express the series expansion coefficient of A and B, you will have to deal with a rational polynomial of all the coefficients of A and B up to order n. This can sound a little scary, but don't worry. Uh, they are all like, like all pre-computable with symbolic math. Um, and, and, and then you, you can just feed uh, these functions to a numerical script. I will actually give a demo of this at the end of, of the talk, hoping to, to convince that it's not as hard as it seems. How expensive does it get? Let's say if, if you're doing something in a deep regime where you need many well, a couple of wells, um, you might need a, I don't know, a hundred terms in the expansion potentially, mm -hmm. or if you want to begin to capture things like charge dispersion mm -hmm. relations, uh, you mm -hmm. may need 
like hundreds of terms would does that is that then tractable still yes Th thanks for the question so um as you will see these 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 um combination functions are all going to be used around one of the possible minima of a structure that might have more than one minima. So what you could do in principle is, okay, let's say I want to study the properties of the circuit around a certain minima, and it's going to be clear later how to pick a certain minima, then you can do the Taylor expansion up to any order that you want. <clears throat> Obviously, if you, if you want to catch um, physical interactions, for instance, between uh, two minima, you will have to use um, a tight binding uh, method to deal with that. So ideally, like, you can do that, but I will say that this method is very useful if you're interested into the low energy properties of a circuit uh, that works around one of its minima. Yeah. <coughs> Regarding yeah, charge distribution, that, that can also be applied after. So you, you, you see, like, I would say that you can do the nonlinear analysis on the inductive network. And then before you quantize your Hamiltonian, you also insert a charge offset. And then if you do the quantization correctly, um, all the effects of charge dispersion that can also be merged with a Taylor expansion of the potential energy function will be accounted for obviously with some de degree of approximation. Okay, good. Yeah, because that's interesting because, you know, this was one big argument in discussion with the energy participation ratio paper where mm -hmm. it takes this strategy of, you know, linearizing the system around uh, a minima of the potential energy and then expanding yeah. a Taylor series. And the question is, can you recover the charge dispersion? And mm -hmm. uh, you certainly can do it numerically by including enough of the terms of the polyno of the, of the cosine. You have to be careful with the numerics because the Taylor series can be convergent or non-convergent. Like if you exactly. take yes, two, yes, you know, absolutely. You can get bounded absolutely. or unbounded spectra. Um, yeah. And so, uh, so, yep. so, I guess yeah, you have to. You, it can be done, but you you have, you have to be careful. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, I mean. I, I don't know if I will have time in the end, but in some sense, <clears throat> if if the effects of charge dispersion that you are talking about are those related to the presence of phase leaps, then what we can do is essentially we can find all the possible equilibrium points of the circuit, which are the static points around which phase leaps can occur. And then you can do Taylor expansion around each of these points. And then by doing a sort of graphical um, analysis, you can kind of infer qualitatively what is going to happen in terms also of, um, of charge dynamics. But it's, it's, it's not as immediate as if you will compile the whole Hamiltonian with n bodies and, and find the eigenstates. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so now once we have these two uh, rules to combine elements either in parallel or in series, we can recursively apply them to model a dipole. Indeed, let's suppose that we have an arbitrary structure of this kind, which is DC flux bias. Now, this DC flux bias is going to impose um, a DC phase drop across each of the elements, which we are going to call an equilibrium point. So now what we can do, we can take the potential energy function of each of these elements. And you know that these potential energy functions are ana analytical functions. And we can expand the potential energy function of the x element around its equilibrium point phi bar of x. And in this way, we can compute the <clears throat> the Taylor expansion coefficients. Now what we can do, we can split the loop in, in, the, in the two arms, uh, the left arm and the right arm. So we are introducing the set of the left elements, uh, capital X of L, and the set of the right elements, capital X of R. And then we can apply the previously defined series combination to each of them. Now what do we do? 
we essentially compute the expansion coefficient of the whole left arm, which we are going to call uh, uh, sub Lm, and the expansion coefficients of the whole right arm, which we call R of n. Now we can reduce the representation of this loop essentially to the parallel of, of, of two nonlinear elements, L and R, of which we know the, uh, the expansion coefficients from these formulas here. And then trivially, the expansion coefficient of their parallel is going to be the sum of the two. So what does it mean? This means that uh, with this technique, we can, we can um, um, derive the expansion coefficient of a dipole without an a priori knowledge of its potential energy function. So you see here, we start <clears throat> from, from the potential energy function of the individual elements inside the loop, but we never have to express the, the overall potential energy function of the dipole. And this is a very nice thing because it means that we can apply a sort of bottom up approach to, to build the um, uh, uh, desired uh, Taylor expanded potential energy and energy function. So in this way, we have some sort of like Lego-like blocks. We know that uh, each element is going to have a, a certain behavior, and then when it's contextualized to to the loop, is going to um, to produce certain effects. Um, but um, one, one, yeah. one question around that: How do you find phi x bar? Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. This is uh, my next couple of slides, actually. Okay. Because <laughs> so this is the question. Yeah, that would involve the global geometry. Uh, yes, exactly. So I'm I'm going to show this in the next uh, couple of slides, and this is I think one of the most like interesting parts of the talk because this was very like computational, but the next one is going to have some more uh, yeah. physical um, meaning. Right, yeah, so that one you have to minimize the global potential of, of the entire exactly. element. So in a sense, you kind of have to construct it, but you, you're only looking at the minima. So I guess, yeah, well, exciting. Exactly. Exciting to see, okay. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So, so, so now as Zlatko was anticipating, I'm going to, to answer the question on how do we compute these equilibrium points? Because obviously this whole thing uh, holds onto that because if I if I know the potential energy function analytically, but I don't know the point around which I have to expand it, then the problem is still there. So um, let's let let's go to that. So now we're going to go to this um, second section of the first part, which is how do we compute the equilibrium points? So let's let's assume that we have an arbitrary uh, superconducting dipole, uh, which has a certain amount of elements in the left arm and a certain amount of elements in the right arm. Uh, this dipole is flux biased with, a, with an external DC flux. And as a consequence, there is going to be a persistent loop current flowing in, into it. <clears throat> so if we just want to look at the static pro properties around the minima of, of this circuit, we have to satisfy this constraint. So in principle, we should like write the potential energy function of, of, the, of the dipole, uh, compute its gradient, and impose that the gradient is the, the zero vector. This can, can, can give, as a result, a set of transcendental trigonometric equations, which typically do not have analytical solutions. However, if we specify this constraint to the fact that the system under investigation is an, electri an electrical circuit, these constraints tell us, tells us that this loop current is the only current allowed to flow at all. This means that the net current flowing through this um, node here, it's always going to be zero when this uh, constraint is sa satisfied. So what does it mean? This mean that this means that this static equilibrium of this loop can be described by uh, these Kirchhoff equations here, and very remarkably, these Kirchhoff equations are equivalent to a circuit made by essentially taking the loop and unwrapping it into a branch. 
So we call this branch the equivalent open branch associated to the loop on the left. And it's obtained by essentially arraying in series all the elements that we have in the left arm and all the elements that, that we have in the right arm. Uh, this equivalence holds <clears throat> as long as we treat the loop current as the net current flowing through uh, the equivalent branch. And the total phase, uh, uh, sorry, the total uh, flux threaded to the extern, uh, to, to, to the dipole um, needs to be associated to the total phase drop across the equivalent open branch. So this means that if we study the, the uh, sorry the physics and in general the current phase relation of this equivalent open branch, we can get information about the equilibrium points of the elements that are into these flux bias dipoles. So how do we get that? <clears throat> Well, to, to understand the, the method, I like to use this simple, but I think already uh, pretty comprehensive example. So let's assume that we have a structure of this kind. So let's consider an equivalent open branch made by a smaller junction, which we are going to call the free junction. And this is going to be clear in a minute. Then we have a bigger junction here and a linear in inductance. So these three elements now needs to be considered as if they belong to a loop, but they have been unwrapped and arranged into this equivalent open branch. Now, uh, superconductivity um, has a very, very interesting property, which is the following. If I apply a DC magnetic flux bias to, to a dipole, <clears throat> Um, then um, I cannot exceed the critical current of any uh, Jolson junction inside it. So what does it mean? This means that if, if this represents a dipole, there is flux bias with an external DC current, the loop current that this, that this uh, phase bias can, can, can induce can never exceed the critical current of the smallest junction in it. So what does it mean? This means that while this element, the smallest junction, which now we can call the free junction, is going to be able to, uh, to, to have a, a, a classical phase particle rolling from minus infinity to plus infinity, the other elements will not be able to do su such a thing. And this comes from the fact that the maximum current that can flow through the other elements is going to be bounded by the critical current of the free junction. So if we consider the current phase relation of the linear inductor and of the bigger junction, you can see that as soon as we impose that uh, the maximum current through them cannot exceed the critical current of the free junction, this also implies that the maximum phase that they can sustain across them is going to be bounded in a box. For this reason, we are going to call all the elements which are not the free junction, uh, we're going to call them the constrained elements. Now, very remarkably, um, the current phase relation of the linear inductance and as well of the bigger junction can be inverted into in, inside this box because the boundaries that are imposed by uh, the free junction essentially make these functions live in a monotonic region. So what does it mean? This means that <clears throat> we can express the equilibrium points of the linear inductance and of the bigger junction as a function of the DC phase drop across the free junction itself. And this is a very useful representation because it allows us to, um, to express not only the total flux, which is going to be the sum of all the phase drops across each element, but also the expansion coefficient of the free junction and as well of the constrained junctions as analytical functions of the phase drop across the free junction itself. And this can be generalized to an arbitrary set of elements. And so it can be applied to, to an arbitrary dipole. Yes. Can you relate this for us to the washboard potential picture, you know, where you mm -hmm. have a, a, a junction and an inductor and you kind of see that, okay, you know, if 
if um, if you just have the junction, you have a cosine. Um, mm -hmm. um, but yes, as you increase the bias, I want to say you get this tilted washboard potential. Yep. I think the current in that case is how fast the particle is running down the potential. Yes, yes, thanks. So, so right. I, there, I, feel like I think no that, yes, yes. I think that the picture of the washboard potential is actually very useful when you have an external DC current bias. Because in that case, you can actually force uh, the, the, the max, uh, sorry, you, you can force the total current through a junction to exceed the critical current. Um, so in that case, you can see like, like, yes, okay, if I have a DC current bias, then my washboard potential can tilt uh, even like, you know, after uh, a certain value that starts to, to, to make the phase roll between all the, um, the wells. But in that case, you are already assuming that your system is going to work outside the, the pure superconducting Re, re, regime. However, in this case, it, like I like to think of it in this way, we are actually imposing phase biases directly rather than current biases. And when you apply a magnetic ADC magnetic flux, you are directly imposing a phase bias to the elements. But because the current is a function of the phase, with a sign in in the case of Joyson tunnel junctions, the phase of in this case the smallest junction can assume any uh, any value between minus infinity plus in infinity, and the total current flowing through it is never going to exceed its critical current. So I think this is a subtle difference between current bias and flux bias, which is one of the key um, key ideas behind uh, this. Um, uh, the findings in in these slides. Yeah. A couple of questions from the audience from Ron. Are using the phase phase drop to just mean the phase change plus or something other <clears throat> different? Oh yeah, sorry. I mean the difference between the phase of the of the of the superconducting wave function on the left and on the right, or if you want to see it, is going to be the difference between the order parameter of the top uh, superconducting metal and the bottom superconducting metal. Yep. OK. I guess you meant the phrase phase drop, not the phase phase drop. Ah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. The phrase yeah. phase drop, yes. Yes. And yeah. uh, for well, let's see if it's drop. I, I say drop because the phase can be linearly related to a voltage, and we typically in jargon say voltage drop. So mm -hmm. yeah. uh, from Raul, is there a side side effect uh, on the size of the junctions and the current going through it? I think he's wondering are there side effects or things to worry about with the current being so big, potentially going through these? Uh, like, is this model good enough still, or is there some issues like in the current oh, case you have to worry about? Well, um, being on. I I think that as long as the surrounding environment can sustain currents up to the ones that you do without heating, and then can create some avalanche effects and break in the superconductivity, this model should hold. So even if you have like very big not not niobium junctions that can hold currents up to maybe milliamperes, uh, as long as 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 your system is safely in the superconducting state, then this model can be applied. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys for the questions. Um, feel free to repost any that I missed, and we'll take any that I missed towards the end of the talk as well. So. Keep them coming in the chat. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now I think it 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 should be a little more more clear. How do we compute the um, the equilibrium phase drops across each of the elements uh, that belong to a flux biased superconducting dipole? Now, what, what what I want to discuss is another important point, which is how do we deal with the multi stability? Because as many of you know, uh, these loops can actually uh, be configured. To, to have more than one uh, minima. So <clears throat> to do this, we, we, we can dig a little more into the current phase relation of an, of an arbitrary branch. 
So if we define these quantities, the beta L and the beta J, which are the ratios between the inductance, in this case of the linear inductance for beta L over the Jolison inductance of the free junction, and the beta J is going to be the ratio between the Jolison inductance of the big junction over the Jolison inductance of the free junction, then we can write more compactly uh, the, the phase drops across uh, the constraint elements in this way. And as we were saying before, the total phase drop can be computed as the sum of the phase drops across each element. And the loop current is going to be common to all the elements. So for the sake of simplicity, we are, we are going to, to express uh, this uh, loop current, in this case, the net current through the equivalent open branch, as the total current flowing through the free junction. And as you can see, now we have expressed the current phase relation of this arm as a parametric curve. And in particular, the parameter that we use to parameterize um, this, this equ equation in, um, in this way is the, is the phase across the free junction itself. Now, based on these equations, we can do um, graphical analysis, which I find pretty nice because it gives a very intuitive un understanding on what happens when we have a multi-stable case. So let's, let's assume that we are studying um, the equivalent branch that I showed in the previous slide. And now what do we have here? We have a plot of the total phase as a function of the free junction phase the total current as a function of the uh, free junction phase. And then we can plot the phase versus the current into this bottom plot. And this is going to be a parametric curve, which we call gamma. And I want you to focus your attention on uh, this tangent vector gamma prime, in particular when evaluated around minus pi or equivalently pi. So now we are in the case where beta L is 0.25 and beta J is 0.25. Now I'm going to sweep uh, beta L and let's see what happens to the tangent vector here. So you see, as I increase beta L, the direction of the tangent vector changes. Most importantly, what what changes significantly is um, the, the sign of the horizontal component of this vector. So you can see that if we have a positive horizontal component, then we're going to have only a single uh, solution. What does it mean? It means that if I apply a certain value of external flux and this component is purely positive, then there is going to be only one possible intersection on the y-axis. This means that for one value of external flux, we're going to have only one possible value of loop current. However, if this horizontal component is negative, in certain regions of external flux, we can have more than one value of loop current. And what does that mean? That means that our circuit can actually uh, stabilize itself um, around different minima of its effective potential energy function. So what we can do now, we can go to a more like detailed analysis of this. So we can write essentially uh, the, the horizontal component of this vector and it can be expressed in this way. And when, when we evaluate it around minus pi or equivalently pi, we get this very compact and simple expression. So if we have an arbitrary branch which includes a linear inductance and also like many Joyson junctions, um, what do we have to look at? We have to sum all the betas defined by the, the constrained elements into, into that arm. And then we have to ask if the sum of those betas is greater than one or less than one. So if it's greater than one, that means that the, um, the or horizontal component of this tangent vector of the current phase relation around minus pi is going to be negative. And that means that it is possible to have more than one solution in our circuit. But if, if the sum of these betas is going to be less than one, then we are sure that when we apply a flux bias, there is going to be only one possible equilibrium point for the system or equivalently uh, one uh, solution for the current phase relation. 
we can go even further and uh, specialize our analysis to the case where, where we have multiple solutions. So in that case, how should we pro proceed? Well, because everything is parameterized by uh, the phase drop across the free junction, what, what we have to do to, to model an experimental case is the following. Let's suppose that we apply a certain value of external flux uh, phi e bar. Because this is the equivalent open branch representation, we can assume that the total phase across the equivalent open branch needs to be equal to the ex external um, flux bias. Now, when we impose this, you will see that this yellow curve will intersect um, the, the relation between the total phase and the small junction, uh, sorry, and the free junction phase drop in five points. And so in principle, one can do a numerical search here and find all the intersections. However, one can use the translational symmetry of this function that can also be inferred from the analytical expression uh, showed in the previous slide to do the following trick. So we can focus only on the first period of this um, total phase versus free junction phase re re relation, and then define a grid of effective external magnetic fluxes that we will have to use to intersect with this function in just the first period. So what does this mean? This means essentially that we can map all the solutions that belong to uh, periods which are like below or above the first period we can just map them all back to a single period of this function. This obviously eases a lot the computation and actually allows us also to define some, some quantitative rules to count the number of minima and maxima that uh, an arbitrary loop can have. So as you can see, uh, all the solutions that are going to be on top or let's say above pi are going to be given by uh, this, this expression where these brackets are the floor functions, as well as all the solutions that are going to be below pi are going to be given by this expression here. So once we, we know what's the maximum uh, overall phase drop across the arm in the first period, which is something that can be found easily an analytically, then we can compute these quantities and say, okay, the maximum number of of equilibrium points or number of wells, including also the maxima that our loop can have is given by this ex expression. And this is very nice be be because these expressions are a function of the external flux. So in this way, I can understand when I change the flux uh, threaded to my loop, how is the, the effective potential energy changing in a qualitative way? And then around each minima or also around each maxima, we can use the, um, uh, the theory that I showed before to compute the expansion co coefficients and infer, for instance, what's the curvature of uh, ar around those points and so on and so forth. So now that I've uh, explained like the core of the theory, I'd like to, to show some useful results and app applications. So this deals, uh, uh, this introduces the part two of this talk. Um, so yeah, now I, I just want to show like a couple of, of interesting results that can be obtained by this approach, which in my opinion, um, in some sense that define some simple intuitive thumb rules that can be used by designers of quantum circuits to, to to, to gather intuition on what happens if I place my components in a certain way. So let's start with this. So there is a very nice symmetry in this uh, DC flux bias su superconducting dipoles that is essentially based on the fact that there is only this loop current that can flow uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the arms of the dipole itself. So because this loop current is common to the left arm and the right arm, this means that all the components in the left arm and all the components in the right arm are going to be threaded by the same current. It's also very interesting to notice that 
the first order expansion coefficient of the potential energy function is indeed this DC loop current. So what does it mean? The first order expansion coefficient of each of these elements is going to be equal to the loop current. So this means that the first order expansion coefficient of all the elements in the in the in the right arm is going to be is going to have opposite sign but same absolute value of the first order expansion coefficient of each element in the left arm. And these for Jewison junctions, because they have a, a, a trigonometric type of nonlinearity, implies that actually all the odd expansion coefficients of the elements in the left branch are going to have opposite sign but same absolute value of all the odd expansion coefficient of each Jewison junction in the right branch. This is a very useful thing to remind when assembling um, a, a Jewison loop because by um, if you if you play correctly with these rules you can actually find some very nice cancellation points that can be used to to design more ro robust um, superconducting dipoles. There is also like some an, another interesting property of the series combination function uh, that I uh, briefly introduced before. So um, obviously, as you can imagine, if we arrange the dipoles A and B in this order, or if we swap them, so we put B on top and A on the bottom, the expansion coefficients are not going to change. And that's quite trivial. So it can be formalized in this way. From the symmetry, we can also infer that if we arrange two identical elements, A and A, what, what we are going to get in the end is just a rescaled version of the expansion coefficient of each of them. So we can say that if we concatenate identical elements, this gives a trivial rescaling of their expansion coefficients. However, if we analyze the more general case where we array two different elements, in this case A and B, we can see, for instance, from the uh, expansion coefficient of the fourth order term of the series, that you're going to have a direct term that only depends on the linear um, co coefficient of each element, as well as the same order co coefficients of each element. But there is also another term, which I call the indirect term, which depends on the linear part and on the previous nonlinear order. And this term is, is zero if the two elements are identical. So you see these indirect term are very interesting because this means that you can produce an effective four, fourth order nonlinearity by using third order nonlinearities only. And then if you combine these properties with the ones that I showed be, be, before that re re relate the odd nonlinearities of the left elements and the right elements, it is possible to find many, many analytical expressions that, 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 that can ease the, the engineering of uh, nonlinearities in this type of structures. So now, um, among the applications that, that, we can, that, that, that we can do of this theory, I think one of the most interesting is is the following. We can use this theory to to generate uh, to to ge generate a robust optimization uh, pr procedure for su super conducting loops. Indeed, because we can express analytically the Taylor expansion of an arbitrary uh, flux bias dipoles, this means that we can also express analytically the um, Hamiltonian that it implements when uh, we shunt it with um, a superconducting capacitor. So this Hamiltonian can be expressed um, with parameters being the, um, the phase drop across the free junction, as well as the set of all the electrical parameters of the circuits, including the critical currents of each junction, the linear inductances, and also the charging energy of the capacitance. Now, because this um, Hamiltonian has analytical ex ex expression, uh, we can, for, for instance, fix a set of constraints that we want this Hamiltonian to, re, to uh, sa satisfy, for instance, on the frequency, on the nonlinear uh, photon exchange rates, and also on the, on the zero point 
fl fl fluctuations of, of the phase um, variable. All these things can be formalized an analytically and then plugged into an optimizer. Now, to the optimizer, you can also give uh, Hessians and gradients that can as well be de derived as functions of uh, phi f and the vector p. And this optimizer will give out, as a result, the set of optimal electrical parameters and the optimal um, uh, phase drop across the free junction. Now, what what do we do with these values? We can see, synthesize a dipole that is built around uh, the values that this optimizer has uh, given. And the flux bias can be essentially just computed analytically from, from the, um, the optimal uh, phase drop across the free junction. This can also be generalized to arbitrary networks, uh, including also coupling to linear environments. And we are currently working on embedding this method with uh, dbq and pi epr. Um, and another interesting application, as I was also mentioning before, is to model the local properties of dipoles that can have more than one uh, equilibrium point. So as an example, I want to show the fluxonium. And just to give you uh, a, a quick time yeah. check, we're, we're at the hour. So we have. OK, yeah, I have a few. Yeah, I just have this and another slide. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So if we analyze the fluxonium uh, with the method that I showed be before, we can do a multi-stability analysis, find all the equilibrium points, and then as you can see, in cases where beta l is ten or a hundred, we can find all the extrema points as well as the expansion coefficient around them. The very interesting thing here is that this type of computation is precise because it's based mostly on analytical e expression, is very fast, and the only numerical step here is linear interpolation. And you can get the position and the curvature of all these uh, extrema points for uh, even for a, a heavily shunted fl fluxonium like, like this. Another application that I see is, is that this method allows to model fa fabrication uncertainty, which can appear as either intra-loop di di disorder, where you have, where you think you you are making like an array of identical elements, but they are actually not. It can also be used to model inter-loop disorder. So if I array two loops which are not exactly identical, what is going to, what is going to be the effect on on the effective potential energy function and I think they also this also leaves like an open question which is can we introduce asymmetries to create more functional devices in in this type of uh, circuits and now as a last um, apl application I want to show you uh, this this uh, code that we developed and published on github at this ad, ad address. This code essentially includes all the computation capabilities that I've described here. And um, as an example, I just want to give you like a quick ov overview of, of what can do. So let, let's suppose that you want to take a non-ideal snail, which includes also like these stray linear inductances, and, they, and then an overall stray linear inductance in series with the snail itself. And then we can take this snail and pack it into a nonlinear resonator. With this code, it is as easy as this. You can import the loop and then the nonlinear oscillator quantities, as well as the junction and the inductance. Now, what do we do here? We define all the elements in the left branch. We define all the elements in the right branch. And then we define the snail as a loop entity. Now, you can see that we can plot the second order expansion coefficient as a function of the external flux. This is in dimensionless units. I'm going to show later how we, we, we can give the units. We can also change dynamically the values of these inductances and uh, junctions. You see now the second order expansion co coefficient has changed. We can also embed this into a linear uh, no linear resonator. Now we can plot the, the frequency of that. And if you if you like to use GUIs, there is also a very simple way to, to, to run this GUI here. Uh, so now with this GUI, we are going to model. Oh, sorry. 
yeah uh, we are going to model the circuit that i had before so we can change the value of the capacitance all the inductances and the Josephson junctions um here the units are that dimensionless but you can use this uh, simple widget here where you fix the current units and it's going to tell you how to interpret all the other values to have a consistent computation we can do parametric variations in real time of the quantities of interest we can plot different quantities like the third order expansion coefficient of the hamiltonian or the fourth and it's also interesting how does it look the multi-stability here well if i increase the critical current of the smallest junction here you see it has it it's labeled as free you see that at a point i have this bifurcation of the curve what does it mean this means that for a fixed value of external flux which here i am plotting on the x-axis i can have two possible resonance frequency each of them is going to correspond to one of the possible minima around which the system is going to be operated at. okay so um, let's go back to the presentation now i i'm going to conclude by um, saying that uh, in in this talk we have essentially demonstrated that it's possible to do a systematic computation of 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 the effective nonlinear Hamiltonian of an arbitrary uh, jo jo Josephson dipole which is threaded via an external flux. Uh, we believe that this analytical des description can help finding uh, novel superconducting devices, which in the future might might give um, like an advance uh, in um, in the in developing better superconducting processors. And we have also defined these like few thumb rules derived from, from this description. Also, it is now possible to, to do a very efficient num numerical opt optimization that can be formulated and solved with, um, with the techniques that I showed. And one of the next steps that we want to do is to generalize uh, the code that I briefly gave you um, on a, a demo of to arbitrary network and integrate it with uh, BBQ and Pi EPR. The demo that I showed is also in this GitHub repo. So if you want to play with it, feel free to download it and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alessandro. This was uh, really nice to see and congratulations Sorry on the for nice being a, a little long. Huh? Sorry for being a little long on the on in the end. That's all right. Uh, Ron said nice function animation is the Python code open source. Uh, yes, is GPL v2. Okay. Okay, great. It is GPL. So, okay, good. And then um, uh, there was a question that's not quite clear from rule, but about adaptations for. Ah, okay. Here we go. Sorry. Hello from Sherbrooke. Here you're really focused on DC flux. What in the theory here specifically relies on DC flux? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, yes, what yes. would be the steps uh, to require to generalize to time-dependent flux? Yes, yes, thanks. So I've actually um, I've actually derived the, the theory to include also AC flux. I did not show this here, neither in the paper, but I will be very happy to discuss further about it. So the the, um, the take-home message for AC flux is the following. Sorry. So yeah, when we combine these two um, these two uh, expansion coefficient of the left arm and the right arm in in parallel, and we say that the expansion coefficients are just the sum, here we are assuming that the only AC quantity is going to be the perturbation of the overall phase drop of the of the dipole around the minima. If you have also AC flux, you, you will want to expand your potential energy function also as a function of the time dependent flux that can be threaded into the loop on top of the DC bias. And that will essentially, that can be modeled as a different uh, weighted sum of these two coefficients. So if you do a derivative with respect to the external AC flux, instead of having just the sum of these two, you're going to have a certain coefficient times the expansion coefficient of the left 
plus another coefficient times uh, the expansion coefficient of the right. And this, then this can be generalized to, to compute uh, like nth order derivatives with respect to the, uh, the phase uh, and nth order derivatives with respect to the external flux. But it, it, it can be treated, uh, it's, it still can be treated analytically, and I think it suits very well uh, this framework. Yeah, okay, that's very nice, Kira. That, I think that's a great follow-up also to discuss. Uh, quick question from Luigi Di Palma. How do you build your net list? Is there a way to easily include it in Nina? Oh, yes, so, <clears throat> yes, yes. Yeah. So far, so far, we did not do yet any uh, netlist implementation. We just focused on the on the core solvers. But the way it is structured, so as as you can see from here, the way we do that essentially, we define the elements and then we arrange them in list. Each list is essentially equivalent to a branch. So what I could see would be like a numeric, uh, sorry, a CAD that will take a net list and then define an element for each uh, co component, parse the net list, defines the branches, assembles them in a, in, in this uh, syntax that is like Nina friendly, and then you can use Nina to compute uh, these DC properties. So this is one of the, um, of the ways we are th th thinking to proceed into further de developing uh, these two. I also have to say that there might be some already ready uh, packages that can do this, which might be um, interesting to, to, to integrate Nina with as like a particular type of solver. That's, that, that, that's also something that um, might be in, interesting to think about. Alessandro, this was wonderful. Um, we've had many questions and uh, many nice comments in the chat. It seems like there's a lot of interest garnering. Um, right. And okay. congratulations yeah. on you know putting in the extra effort to write the software package. And, and start, I saw that there were two files in the documentation kicking off, uh, which is nice. I can appreciate all the extra effort and work uh, this takes. You know, like the, building the PyVR yeah. uh, with yes. Zach and Stephen and others on top and maintaining it for for. A, many years now is is no small effort and no small feat. So thank you for doing that for the community. Um, I think with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the nice work and uh, leave you if you want to share any final words with everyone. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I want to thank again uh, you and all the orga organization to, uh, to have invited me. It was very nice and interesting to, to, to have questions from from the whole world about uh, what I've uh, shown here. And yeah, I, I really hope that this, this theory that I showed is going to motivate more and more people, especially coming from uh, engineering uh, sectors to, to, to enter the field of uh, superconducting quantum circuits, because I think what, what, what really makes this sector powerful is the fact that we have a commission of very different uh, interests and 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 abilities that can be put together to you know like to build what it what what hopefully is going to be like a, a general purpose quantum computer in, in how many years that that's a question that you should answer <laughs> thank you alessandro and with that folks thank you very much you can go back and rewatch this subscribe to the youtube channel next week we have peter zoller on the seminar friday at noon eastern time this talk will stay recorded and with that see you next week have a great day